one more person did it. That's how it goes. All right, so just to confirm, you can't see my screen and you can hear me? Yes, we can. All right, that's awesome. Okay, so welcome everybody um, to our afternoon session. If you were here this morning and put up with me then, you came back, that's lovely to see it. Uh, my name is Nick Rockland. I'm the Research Data Management Specialist with UBC Advanced Research Computing. And today I'm going to give an introduction to UBC Arc Sockeye. Get into that just a bit. Um, but before I jump off, I would like to acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and the UBC Okanagan campus is located on the unceded territory of the Celix Okanagan peoples. Now, a couple of housekeeping slides. Um, you've all been automatically muted when you entered the room if you are joining virtually. Um, this webinar will be recorded and the recording of these sessions will be available on ARC's website, as well as our YouTube channel and um, the OSF pages, which I will speak to in just a few slides. Oh, it was the next slide. It wasn't even in a few slides. So all materials for this boot camp are available in the Open Science Framework. If you were here this morning, um, I think you're familiar with this. If not, I will just jump out to show you this. So we have this boot camp page. Um, if someone, one of the helpers, George, if you could drop it in the chat for the virtual learners, if they're not already there. So you can see here, we have um, some information about the boot camp itself, but really the meat of this is these components, which are session materials for all of the sessions happening throughout the workshops uh, week. And so today, intro to UBC Arc Sockeye, if you click on that, um, there are two main sections here for you. If you scroll down a little bit right here, you can see here are the slides in a PDF format. So feel free to follow along, check these out after the fact. Um, when we have the videos up, the videos will also be added to this section. But um, I think the more pertinent section is this Info for Learners Wiki. So if you go here and click on the read more section, boom, 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 let the computer load, um, then you can see a um, few different things. So if you are in person, um, please click on this link, check in, just uh, a good way for us to keep track of, is someone trying to speak? No, oh, no, I just heard weird blip. I hope, hope I'm all right, I'm hearing things already. It's only Tuesday. Um, yeah, just uh, if you are in person, if you could please check uh, check in that attendance just to keep track of how many people are showing up live. Um, there is a workshop feedback form here for the in-person uh, participants. I will speak to that in just a, a slide or two. Now, explaining how this page works, all of the links or external resources that I'll be referencing in this uh, presentation can be found here. So you can go through, follow along as you see fit. And then as you go down, any kind of commands that I'm going to be referencing um, can all be found here. So you can see how the syntax works, quick copy and paste, and it's a really easy way for you to all follow along. Um, cool, plowing forward. Um, this is a hybrid learning environment for those in person. You know this because you've been struggling through it for the last 15 minutes, but we are now connected. Um, so for those who are attending virtually, you can ask questions via the Zoom Q&A or by raising a virtual hand. I'll spot it, one of the helpers will spot it, and then we can have a little chat that way, or we will just address your question um, verbally or in text with the Q&A. Um, for those live questions in, the, um, in that live room, you can just raise your hand, you know, straight analog, and one of the helpers in that room will either come help you or they'll flag for me to come answer your question if they think everybody would benefit from hearing um, the, the answer. And then, um, yeah, I think that all covers what we're doing here with um, hybrid rooms. Always a little bit uh, janky, but we're making do, and I think it's going to be great. Um, one other thing, it is assumed that you can connect to Sockeye for this session. Um, we did give um, some office hours yesterday. We have all of the documentation in the OS app. So if um, you haven't yet connected to Sockeye, please jump into that OSF page and you can walk through um, the documentation there. And by the time that uh, we get to that point in this presentation where we are in uh, Sockeye, you'll be ready to rock and roll. Um, and then I think the last one, yes, we want your feedback. So as I mentioned, um, participants who are in person, there is that in-person feedback form. 
Um, for those who are signing in virtually, when the Zoom meeting is ended, you'll be prompted to fill out a feedback form. It's very lightweight, two multiple choice questions and some free text. And you know, this is the first time that we're running a workshop like this. And, and I'll speak a bit more to the workshop structure um, at some point early in the presentation, but we're trying to figure out what our users need. And we're getting a lot of people who aren't coming from computational backgrounds. And so wanting to accommodate that crowd, but also make it useful for people who may have already seen these technologies. So, you know, pacing, content, any other feedback notes you have for us, we would love to hear it and continuously um, evolve and, and expand our training. All right. And with that said, did I make it through housekeeping? I did. Love that. Cool. What are we talking about today? So I'm going to kick it off by giving an introduction to research data management, talking about the, the data life cycle and how these concepts will really connect not only to this session, but to the, the general week that we're trying to do here with the boot camp. Then going to quickly talk about what to do when your laptop isn't enough. Um, we'll be talking about sockeye predominantly in the session, but there are other options uh, for HPC and cloud. Um, then I am going to start talking about Sockeye in detail. We'll give an introduction to the structure and some of the key concepts. We'll then move over to giving a tour of a Sockeye allocation, what you can expect to see and find and how to use it. Um, we'll talk about organizing folders a little bit, and then we will finish the lesson by transferring data to and from Sockeye. Can't wait. Um, if you're here this morning, I do try to give a, a couple seconds pause before I start these sections, just because as we create these recordings, we want to timestamp them, divide them up into sub videos. So I'm going to awkwardly pause for two seconds, then jump in. Mm -hmm. All right, now we can jump into the introduction to RDM and the data lifecycle. So the section objectives here are going to describe research data management, or RDM is what I'm going to be calling it and the data lifecycle. I will briefly introduce the tri-agency RDM policy that was released this year. I'm going to outline considerations to be made at the beginning of your project that'll last throughout the entirety of that project, all those considerations that uh, you don't want, or you want to make so things don't go off the rails. And then finalize this by discussing how this all relates to the bootcamp structure and goals. Great, we can actually start talking about the session. All right, so research data management. I hate reading quotes off slides, but I think this one is short enough where I can do it. And so talking about what RDM is, it involves the active organization and maintenance of data throughout the research process and suitable archiving of the data at the project's completion. And so there are a lot of different ways that people speak about RDM, but, but it's really just doing research and being very focused on the data that you collect and just there, there's, I think it's really tempting to just want to think about getting that publication, finishing your work, but ensuring that your processes are, are transparent and reproducible and that others can build off your work and that your collaborators, students, any people that you are working with can all understand what's going on. It's tremendously valuable to the research ecosystem. And that's really something that we're trying to promote. And so in thinking about those concepts, we, we like to idealize the research data lifecycle where, where you would start with a plan. And, and this is not only a plan of your research, but it could involve a data management plan, which talks about how you're gonna move on to create data, or if you're collecting it or collating it, whatever you're doing, um, then you're gonna need to process it and somehow clean it up, put it into a form that you're then going to be able to analyze it. You can then make your world changing findings and you'll wanna preserve them, right? Because people will wanna see it in years to come. You can then share that with other people and then they can reuse it. It creates this beautiful circle. It's awesome, but it is not realistic. Research is an absolute mess. There's all kinds of cross wires. By the end of this, you're gonna have bags under your eyes. You'll be smoking cigarettes, making a murder board. Um, it's a great time. But I think the more that you can think of what this looks like at the beginning, the less cross wires there can be. And hopefully things won't fall off the rails. Although there's always going to be those kind of unpredictable moments. And so relating this to the newly announced tri-agency RDM policy, I believe Liz just dropped it in the chat if you're interested in checking it out, that um, certain funding calls 
will require a data management plan with their applications beginning in fall of 2022. Um, there's going to be progressively more calls that are requiring data management plans as uh, we go forward. I'll, I'll speak to what data management plans are in the next slide, but just kind of priming that pump here. And then there's also this requirement to deposit research data, metadata, and code into a digital repository after a project's completion. Um, that there, the date for this is to be determined, just making sure that we have the infrastructure and support in order to enable this to happen. But really, the impetus for them to have released this policy, and this is about 10 years behind what's going on in Europe and, and Australia and the States, is that, you know, a lot of research is paid for publicly or paid by publicly funded money, right? It's taxpayers. And, you know, at the end of a project, oftentimes you only get a publication that's behind a pretty restrictive paywall. And then there's been movements towards open access to make these papers available, but most people aren't being paid to sit at a computer and write a paper. It's years of data collection and all of the infrastructure and time that it goes into creating that data and wanting to share that data so people have access to it. They can expedite their research. They don't have to reduplicate anything. Like there, there's a greater philosophy for, for the pursuit of knowledge behind this. So it isn't just kind of this blank thing and, and people can see it as a burden. I get it. But just trying to um, talk about a little bit of the philosophy behind things. So with all that said, data management plans, um, it's just a set of questions, right? And they're asking about how, how are you planning on collecting your data? If you're going to document it and the metadata that you have, because you know, if you're collecting this, how would somebody else know what you've done if you didn't provide some sort of documentation? Um, they want to know how you're going to store your data, back it up, how and who can access the data. Um, if you are thinking about preservation, what that might look like, and, and worth noting, not all data needs to be preserved, right? It might not have that that 15 year shelf life, but if you think it does, there are. Um, there are actions that you want to put forth um, at the beginning. Um, and that plugs directly into the sharing and reuse of that data. And you know, skipping a line here, ethics and legal compliance, that's things that happen right at the beginning of a project. And so if you are thinking about sharing your data after, making sure all of those ethics and legal and security provisions are taken in advance so you don't pigeonhole yourself and aren't able to do something with your data that you would like to do. And then on um, this responsibilities and resources, like who's going to do what? Because right? there's a project management aspect to all of this. And like, that's really where, you know, you have these big collaboration teams. Things can get um, pretty hairy if you don't have uh, th those really kind of wrapped up. And so connecting this all, right? Like we've all, I think, gotten to a project or tried to do something. We get to the end, like, oh my goodness, like this, <laughs> this is such a wreck. We put so much time and it just didn't work. And so that's, kind of what we're trying to do with this boot camp. And so if you were here this morning, we started with a very light introduction to Unix just to give people the skills to follow along and be able to get something from this boot camp. Um, we're moving to an introduction to Sockeye today, but if you look throughout the weeks, and um, I will highlight that that GPU session tomorrow morning, um, that is a more advanced section or session, but just because of scheduling, we had to put it second. But um, it, it is valuable to, I think, anybody who, who's willing, who wants to learn that type of thing. But slowly building kind of a scaffold of approach where people can you know, talk about software installation. You can talk about running JAWS, parallel computing, finishing with Chinook, which is an object storage platform that we have at UBC for medium term archiving and other storage needs. And then Globus, which is um, a file transfer software for large amounts of data. And then thinking about depositing data at the end and just thinking about this research data management life cycle, but also acknowledging that a lot of our previous training ha has conflated these ideas. And, and you might get a number of these separate topics taught in three hours. And as I mentioned at the beginning, what we found not only from feedback from the sessions, but from some of the assessments we've done of our users is that ARC training can be really intimidating and it can be way too advanced for beginners, even the intro session. And, and so we're really trying to slow down here, give people a chance to, to ask questions and to, to I, I know it, it sounds so cliche to say, but no question is a dumb question. I've asked the dumbest questions and I've been very nervous to do so, but th this is the arena where it, there, there's no judgment here. And if you don't know something or something isn't making sense, 
it's because I've made an assumption that you know something and that's unfair of me to have done. So, so please, if there is anything here you don't understand, ask a question. That's really what we're trying to do here. And, and just, yeah, slow things down, give people a good foundation. We can scaffold up. All right, so that was a long-winded introduction, but we made it 17 minutes in. Um, I'm going to pause here. Are there any questions, either from our virtual audience or uh, how are we doing with the in-person room? We're good here. We're good? Love that. Virtual room, you're good too? Yes, we are. Oh, love it. Thanks, George. All right, caffeinate up, plowing forward. All right. No, that's not plowing forward. That is. Okay. Okay. So what to do when your laptop isn't enough? Uh, okay. So I am going to rip through this session because we had open house yesterday talking about ARC services. But the section objectives for this is to describe computing options when your laptop isn't sufficient for your workload. We have four essential options that we support. Um, Self-purchase. You can buy it yourself. We have the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, otherwise known as DRAC and all of their wonderful resources. Um, cloud computing might be an option for you. And then um, UBC Arc Sockeye, what we're all here for today. So when your computer does, isn't enough, this might be for a number of reasons. Maybe your analyses are just taking way too long. They're taking days, weeks, and you just don't have that time, right? That's no good. We can help out with that. Um, maybe you don't have enough computing power, CPU, GPU, memory. It's just really not enough to do what you're trying to do. We can help you level up. And maybe you just don't have enough storage. You have huge amounts of data. You're dealing with videos, pic, uh, photos, and it's just, you need more. Wow, all those reasons why your laptop might, just might not be enough. Compelling stuff, people. All right, so the first one is self-purchase. Now, um, for Vancouver folks and for, I think, definitely some of the virtual people, advanced research computing, we can provide recommendations for the self-purchases, um, quotes and budgets for uh, CFI grants, which are major infrastructure grants in Canada. Um, for those on the Okanagan campus, I'm also affiliated with the research computing group here, which is different, but somewhat related to ARC. Um, the recommendations and quotes that they provide um, are slightly different and a bit more comprehensive than what ARC is able to provide. But if you do have some money, you want to buy some computers or some gear, don't go to Best Buy, right? <laughs> Reach out to somebody at the institution, either ARC, Research Computing on the Okanagan, and figure out what it is that, that you can and should buy. Get those recommendations. And um, if you are interested in getting quotes for what you might be looking for, please do reach out to ARC as well. Um, quickly with the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, they are the national provider of digital research infrastructure. They have high performance computing structure uh, clusters. There's um, several host sites across the country that are open to all researchers affiliated with Canadian University. You do have to be a PI in order to apply for an allocation. So if there are grad students out there interested in these resources, talk to your supervisor. They can apply for allocation, give you access, and then you're on the system. Much, And that's much how the model for Sockeye allocations work as well. And then they also offer options for cloud computing. If you're interested in these, um, click on the slides in the OSF page, and you can hyperlink out to those pages. Plowing forward, talking about cloud computing, we also offer our own in-house uh, consultations within ARC to determine how and if cloud is best suited for your work. Um, we do provide direct support for the Alliance Cloud as well, so if you're using that infrastructure. And then we work with major cloud, public cloud providers to offer a single point of contact for accessing public cloud, working through it, and getting you started with those systems. So there's a thesis here. Any questions about cloud? Ask arc.support.ubc.ca. Wow. All right, we made it. We can now talk about UBC Arc Sockeye, unless there are any questions about anything I've said there. Um, In-person room, how are you guys doing? Cool. <laughs> oh, silence on my end, that's all right. I'm so lonely, just kidding, having a great time. Okay, I can plow forward here if there are not any other questions. I can hear you unmuted. Can't actually hear you. That's fine. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm seeing none. 
Oh, hold on. There are some. Oh, get this rope good. Excellent. Oh, a naive question, but how exactly is cloud computing different than sockeye? Okay. So um, there's a few main differences there, and it does depend on your workload. One of the main differences, and this is also, oh, George, you're typing an answer? Okay. If people are interested in that answer. No, sorry, um, uh, Nick, you can carry on. I just to provide some additional info if that's helpful. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, it really depends on your workflow and how well it's suited. One of the main, not necessarily disadvantages of Sockeye because it is in a sense an advantage, but our compute nodes on Sockeye are not connected to the internet. So if you are directly interacting with the internet, be it people who have wearables and you want that data shipped directly to your compute sites, or there's data on the internet that you're trying to directly interact with, that's not something that Sockeye is able to do. And it's possible that cloud computing could be a response for that. Um, we do have Jeff Gardner in the live room who uh, could speak to cloud. Um, I'm not sure if Jeff is able to answer this, but if you do have more detailed questions about cloud, um, please reach out to Ark and to Jeff, and he'd be happy to uh, go into that in more detail. All right, are there any other questions? Okay. So, okay, structure and key concepts. Oh, all right, so the objective of this section, I'm going to introduce Sakai, uh, then going to identify conceptual structure of Sakai, so you show you kind of how it works from a conceptual perspective, and then explain the differences in node types and specifications. And this will all relate to subsequent sessions when we start getting into running jobs and things like that to actually use the system. So first and foremost, what is Sakai? It's a supercomputer. What does that mean? And so just starting off with some key terms um, and, and relating this to your own personal computer as well, that every computer has something called a central processing unit, otherwise known as a CPU. And this is essentially the brain of your computer and it carries out the tasks that your computer does. I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it, but that, that is enough to conceptually understand what a CPU does. Um, you also have RAM and, and this is the memory of your computer, it loads and runs programs, and it allows your computer to quickly access data. Now, finally, you have graphics processing units, otherwise known as GPUs. Um, they can be used to speed up the rendering of graphics. Things look really cool on your computer, but um, they're also progressively being used in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that's really where they plug into the HPC side of things. And so looking at your computer versus Sockeye, um, standard home computers have between two and eight CPU cores. And, and eight is quite high. Um, it's, yeah, it's usually somewhere in between there. And you might have a GPU, but you would have paid for it. Um, Sockeye has 16,000 GPUs and 200 GPUs. So you can start getting a sense that, you know, this is a really big system. We're scaling up here. And so talking about what it is, it is a high performance computing cluster housed at UBC. Um, we'll be using that HPC for that acronym. So I think I did say it a couple times. Sorry if people didn't know what that meant. HPC, high performance computing. Now, when I say an HPC cluster, I'm talking about a group of computers that work together to solve problems much more quickly than a standard computer can. I'll touch on that in just one second. Um, a couple of the special affordances of Sockeye is that it can store very high risk data and it meets on-premise storage requirements because it is housed directly at UBC. Now, when I say a group of computers that works together to solve problems more quickly than your home computer, these are not standard computers. There's no screens, there's no keyboards. It only has the components that are designed to do specific tasks and, and to do them really well. And these kind of mini kind of quote unquote computers are called nodes. Now, taking a look at the structure of Sockeye, now obviously it doesn't look like this, but can help you kind of visualize what the system looks like. Starting on the left here, we have your home computer or laptop. Um, this lovely globe is the internet. And so when you first connect to Sockeye, you'll land on these login nodes. And these are nodes that it's kind of like your homepage for Sockeye. You'll have a little bit of your own personal space here that nobody else can see. Now, you can see kind of going around the horn here, you have storage space, right? Obviously, this is a, a bigger machine. And you, you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit 
about what that storage space looks like in just a couple slides. But you can see here on the far right, we have the compute nodes. And, and this is really where the magic happens. This is where that high horsepower computing occurs. But in order to, to use these compute nodes, you have to go through something called a schedule. And I'm just gonna introduce this in this section, but if you go a couple courses down for running jobs, this is really where these concepts are gonna get teased out. But because our compute nodes are a shared resource, you kind of have to make an appointment with them to, to use them, right? Everybody else is trying to use them. And so you're gonna tell the scheduler, you know, I wanna use you know, this many nodes with how many CPUs, GPUs and memories. And based on how many, how many, sorry, how much resources you're asking for, versus how many other people are asking for resources, it'll put you in a line. And so depending on how you kind of defined your job, how much you're asking for, you might get into that line a little bit quicker or a little bit later, depending on what the other situation in the line looks like. Now, last but not least, we have these data transfer nodes. Um, if you are transferring large amounts of data, this can be quite well suited to, to use that. Now, Couple other things here. So I said that your, your storage space is um, a bit more granular than just that. There's actually two different storage spaces. And, and I will talk to this more in um, a few slides. You have your project space, and this is really where it, it's more like hard storage, where you can just store your files. And then this scrap space, which is also a storage space, but it, it's where you want your results to be printed out to after the computing happens. And, and I'll talk a bit about that, but just, Letting you know that there are two different storage spaces is kind of the main thing you can take away from this slide. And last, as I mentioned, um, all of these parts of the system are connected to the internet, but our compute nodes are not. And so if there is data from the web that you're trying to access, you can bring it on to your project or scratch space onto your storage, and then you will be able to run a job from here. Um, I'm going to briefly pause here in case there's any questions about the structure of Sakai or if uh, I've just muddied the waters by introducing all these terms. Yeah, I have a question. Um, maybe it's preferential, but why is why, why there are two storage? There's project and scratch. It's, um, why was it organized this way? So um, just so I can double, I can confirm what you said, the, the volume is a little bit weird. You're wondering why there's a project space and a scratch space? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, can I put a pin in that for like five minutes? Because I'm gonna get into that in more detail. This is really just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're totally telecasting uh, what I want to talk about. That's a great question. Once I do talk about it though, I'll touch back with you. And if you have any further questions, then we can tease that apart. Okay, thank you. Okay, that, that's a great question though. I, li I like people forecasting where things are going. Um, are there any other questions? All right, plowing forward. All right, so talking a bit about our nodes and, and again, like looking at this slide, I can tell like from a user's perspective, this is an absolute nightmare. It looks just like a bunch of words, letters. Ugh, what am I looking at? You don't need to memorize any of this, but when you get to the the job the running job section, a lot of this stuff will start to make sense and you'll see it's important. And so when we have these nodes, we have our compute nodes and CPU and GPU, and that's this big green circle here. Now, what you need to know is just like the main takeaway is that there are different numbers of the types of nodes that we have. The nodes have different amounts of CPU cores. They have different amounts of memory and then there's different GPUs. Now, I know that that sounds quite artificial. Why am I talking about this now? But when you're talking about asking resources from the system, understanding what the system is capable of it, it is pretty important to figuring out what, what you can ask from it, right? Because if you're asking something that isn't available, the system just can't give it to you and, and it'll fail. And so this is really about not necessarily memorizing this, but understanding conceptually that there are limitations to what the machine is architecturally and working within those bounds. Now below here in the red, you can see there's a login node. As I mentioned before, this is where you're going to end up. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go to all these different places. And then there is also the data transfer node. Okay, so why is this important? I'm gonna reiterate everything I've just said. Um, login nodes, this is where you access Sockeye. You can set up your environments. You can do small to moderate data transfers. You can see here, I got an exclamation point. 
do not run your analyses here. I will explain all of this in just a few slides. I understand I'm building up a lot what's going to happen in these future slides. Hopefully I come through. Um, data transfer nodes for larger data transfers. And then those compute nodes, the main takeaway is not connected to the internet and there are resource limits and just to be aware of those. Okay, I ran through that section. Um, in addition, so I'm still keeping your question about the project in Scratch in my mind, making that clear, but are there any other questions that I've said? And then if you think that I might answer them in the future, please feel free to answer them now, just so I can be cognizant of where I might not have been clear, just, and I can spend a bit more time on it with uh, the slides that I have planned. Or if I haven't planned for it, I can answer it right now. Uh, what is wall time? Jeff, that's a great question. Okay, so wall time. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing it. So this will be apparent in the running jobs section. But wall time is, oh, oh, sorry, Liz, I thought you were typing it. You just asked to, to do it live. Wall time is how long a job can be waiting in the queue or to be running. And our wall time maximum is a week, right? And so if you're trying to schedule um, the system for two weeks for a single task, that, that's not how the system is organized. You have a maximum of seven days. Um, please follow up with me if that doesn't make sense. And um, Jeff, Jerry, George, Liz, if you have a better answer, please feel free to jump in. Um, second question here, is data stored in both the project and scratch folders permanent or does it get cycled periodically? Okay, in our system, um, so I'm, oh, did you, Liz, did you type an answer? You can if you want. Um, we, we, we don't purge our system. Compute Canada does purge their scratch space. I believe every 60 days, um, we, we will not delete your files. Although um, if you are keeping a lot of files in the scratch space and not doing anything with them, we'll bug you to move them, um, essentially is the answer to that. Um, and if that wasn't your question, please let me know. Um, is that what you were asking? I just see the word permanent in there. And, and permanent is always a, um, a vacuous word when you're talking about data storage. Okay, perfect, it did answer it. Love when that happens. Okay, um, are there any other questions before I jump to the next section? Going once, going twice. Next section it is, Bah. All right, let's do a tour of a sockeye allocation. This is where we can get into the fun, start playing around a little bit. All right, so the objectives for this section, we're gonna use some basic commands to view details of an allocation that you would get on sockeye. Oh no, I'm not plugged in. One second, people. Oh, I thought I had it plugged in. Ha, ah, the world is safe. All right, now we can move between directories and identify their purpose. And then we're gonna finish by creating symbolic links. What's a symbolic link, Nick? Great question. I'll answer it in about 30 slides. Okay, so this is the point of the presentation where um, you're gonna connect to Sockeye and I'm going to do it too. We can do it together. It'll be so much fun. Um, as mentioned, if you haven't yet connected to Sockeye, um, please uh, check out that documentation and then uh, we can go from there. Um, people both in the virtual room as well as in person is the sizing for um, both my command line and um, the slides, okay? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, perfect, thanks. The, the writing isn't too high? Uh, it's perfect. Okay, thanks, Jerry. All right, now, it's kind of skewed here, but you can see, oh, the fish got cut off. Never mind. It makes a nice little acai fish, but uh, cool. All right, so I'll give people two minutes to connect to Sakai, and then we can start plowing forward, playing around. Probably connecting with um, you because of the video. 
Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Same, same error. So I, I logged the IT ticket and was waiting for that response. Maybe I do need it. Or there's an error, error on the phone. An error on the phone or no on the shell, right? When I'm so when I type in the passcode, mm -hmm. right, just come back and say that I need I this encryption. Did it, did it ask you to select one or two? Yeah, it does. And did you try number two or you just try one? I try I try number two, it doesn't send an SMS. Oh it's probably has the message. I don't think we can do that. Uh, so you yeah, yeah. I have a yeah, new ticket. Yeah. I submitted a ticket yesterday. Okay. So I'm okay. Sorry, not in medium priority, so let's see how that. Yeah, it's all under their control. Yeah, so I have the ability to change that. Um, but all of this is posted on the and what is now going to access if you don't open the yeah. and so I, I think I'm eavesdropping in what's happening in the live room. I can kind of hear things. Is the error that the um, the person submitted a ticket for an enhanced CWL and hasn't heard back yet? We had the enhanced CWL. He joined us in the drop-in session yesterday. It's Raymond, and he I got your name correct. Right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, his error is with the authentication piece. He doesn't receive the code. Okay, so um, yeah, and there was an issue with the the, the hardware token. Yeah. Um, Raymond, if you could reach out to one of us and send us your tick the, the number for you, you said you submitted a ticket. Yeah, yeah. If you want to send um, it, yeah. yeah, so send it to one of us. I did this for somebody yesterday. We can actually escalate the urgency of it, um, on our end. And so while we don't have control of the infrastructure, we can try to push it through a little bit faster. So um, hopefully it'll be processed by tomorrow. I don't know if I'm actually allowed to say that we do that. <laughs> Anyways, I did it for someone else. Sorry to confess this. It's for being recorded. <laughs> yeah, now we have proof. <laughs> yeah, IT's coming after me. Whatever. <laughs> OK, so I am going to plow forward here. I just want to be helpful. Um, but I hope most people are able to follow along. All right, so as I mentioned, you should be able to zoom in for a little bit. Oh, that's not going to work. All right, so logging in for the first time, you will see a cool fish that uh, one of our assistants can build. Um, taking a look at where we are, you can press PWD, this stands for Print Working Directory. You can see this home space. And so right here, you can see we are on the login node. And this is my home directory. Now, this is a directory that even though the allocation is a shared space, only I can see this. And so if you want to work with any type of scripts that you're being kind of, um, you don't want to share any type of documentation that you're playing around with, this can be a good place to keep it. It is a relatively small storage space, so you can't keep the big files there, but it is good for that type of uh, smaller documentation. Um, plowing through, you can then type groups and your CWL, and this will show you which allocations you are a part of. And so you can see here, I have a much longer list than um, most of you will probably have just because I'm on a number of allocations. Um, this is the allocation that, that we're working with. And you can see there's a couple. There's just the regular bootcamp one. You can see that the GPUs are a bit of a different one. There's the read and write permissions. But it's also always good just to know what your allocation code is in case you forget, because that's um, a key to your file paths and being able to navigate the system. Um, who's on your team? Who is part of this? And so if I do this print underscore members, one, two, three, let you catch up, hit it. Oh, wow, what a list. Um, so you can see um, I'm part of a number of allocations, but you can see the different people on these allocations. Um, the advantage for having something like this, and, and it'll be different depending on your working environment, but oftentimes, Sockeye allocations, as well as Compute Canada allocations, they're shared spaces. And you know, if there's a person on your allocation who just, they're storing terabytes and terabytes of their stuff there, they're not moving it, and it's impeding your workflow, this is a way to find out who that person might be so you can tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, please move your stuff. You're being kind of rude and hogging the system. And hopefully they're cool and they do that. 
there's probably other reasons as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump back in the slides, and this is where I'm talking about why there's different storage spaces. Great, we made it. Um, so for your home space, and you can see here, these are the file paths, so home and your CWL. This is where you can put things like your configuration files, the little scripts. And again, this is your private space. None of this is shared. It's your own little landing page. Uh, next one is your project space. And so you can see here, this is the file path for your project space. Um, this is where you can put your project data. You have the big shared software, things that you want other people in your allocation to see, potential databases. And then here's your scratch space. And so again, Here's the, the file path. And this is where you can have batch jobs and job scripts. Now, looking at these arrows, this is really where the project and scratch gets differentiated. So you can see here, these are the compute nodes. The compute nodes can read anything in the home space. They can read anything from the project space and they can read anything from the scratch space. But you can see that they only write to the scratch space. And what I mean by write is that when you put jobs or, or work onto the system, they will print the results somewhere. They cannot print to your project space. They cannot print to your home space. They can only print to your scratch space. And so when you start thinking about where you're going to keep your files and where you're going to keep certain types of data, which I will touch on in a few slides, this is really where you want your raw input data to go, to be read to the system, and then you can have your scratch space free to have all of those raw results spit out and to ensure that there's enough room for those results to be written to that scratch space. Now, there was a question in that live room. Did this answer your question about why there's two different storage spaces? And if not, please let me know and um, how I could best clarify this. Oh, uh, yeah, this was clear. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, are there any questions about these different storage spaces or their uses? And noting that I, I, I keep saying what I'm gonna do, a lot of future tense here. Um, I, I will start talking about um, how these can be best organized. All right, let's plow forward. All right, so what are my storage file and file limits? That's a great question, very, oh, whoa, whoa. All right, hold on. So I'm just gonna clear this and so, Knowing your storage and file limits is very important. So if I go print underscore quota, can I spell quota? That's a great question. I hope I can. And I hit enter. Then I wait because it's a live demo and things never happen instantaneously in them. Okay, we're loading up. Love it. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up and you see that I have a few different allocations. So my list is probably longer than yours. But you can see, here's my, my home space. This is my own private space. You have the 50 gig limit. And then this is how much of it I have currently used. So still got a lot of places there. Now, if we go down, where is the boot camp, boot camp, boot camp? Okay, here, perfect. All right, so we have the scratch space for the boot camp. You can see we have the quota, five terabytes. Um, use Grace. 4K. Okay, so we're, we haven't used that many. And so you can just see how much you've used based to what your limit is. And then, hold on, going down, let me rise it to the middle of the page. This is your quota for um, the project space in the bootcamp. So you can see the quota hard limit, how much you've used. We still got a ton of space. It's beautiful. Um, I'm seeing there's a queue. Do you have Scratch in your file project as well? Um, could you clarify what you mean by file project there? Um, I've, I've had a busy day today. I've second session. And my mind is quite fuzzy. I, I'm not too sure what you're um, you're asking there. If you would like to uh, to jump on, I can unmute you. Or um, if you want to clarify what you mean there in the text, I'd be happy to jump onto that as well. And please just indicate in the Q&A if you want to be unmuted or feel free to type out that question. Yes, please unmute. Okay, um, allow to talk. Okay, uh, can you, I think you're there. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just a bit confused, um, but I'm just curious about how scratch works so 
is it is your is scratch within your your project like allocation or is it a separate thing like on its own or are they two okay so you are not confused i did a terrible job of under, uh, explaining this so thank you so much for uh, for pointing this out so your project storage and your scratch storage are two separate things every allocation that you get on sockeye comes with five terabytes of project storage and five terabytes of scratch storage did okay. that answer your question yeah so there's there is project and scratch but then within project there's scratch as well no, no project and scratch are two so you can think of them as two separate storage systems okay okay so both good. of them come stock with an allocation and both of them come stock with five terabytes of storage although if you do need more and you can kind of prove that you need more that that, that can be negotiated okay okay i understand okay um that's, no th thank you for pointing that out i didn't even talk about what the allocation gives um, always nice to see where uh, the holes in my game are. Um, are there any other questions about this? Because that, that was a brilliant question. Okay, I will continue uh, down this path. All right, so going back to the slides here, moving some Zoom stuff around so I can actually see what I'm doing. Cool. So going back to the directories of an allocation and thinking of a very high level, non-detailed um, description of, of what your workflow would look like. You start here with your computer, the internet, you have your home space, you know, your scripts, your pipelines, things you don't wanna share, but you also have your project space. And like I said, this is where, you know, you can have that raw input data, your large tools and databases can go there. And so when you're ready to run your work on the compute nodes, the compute nodes can read these spaces. So the, um, they can come here, the compute nodes do their thing, boom, they spit it out into the scratch space. Now in the scratch space, you might develop what's called intermediate files. Now, if, if you're not familiar with this term, um, when you can do, when you're doing certain types of analyses, sometimes you'll generate a lot of files before you arrive to that final thing. Like it'll print something and it'll print maybe thousands of files, analyze those and you'll develop files that you don't actually need, but were part of the process to get to the end. Now you do want to clean those up regularly. I have talked to people who they you don't they they feel an attachment to these files. They created them. They don't want to lose anything, but they do take up unwanted storage space. So just be very cognizant of that. Um, once you have your final result in your scratch space, you can bring that final output and your important intermediate files back to your project space because you want to keep the scratch as free as possible, and you can kind of keep kind of. Um, repeating this pipeline or, or developing other pipelines that are more suited to your workflow. I'm going to pause there. Are there any questions about this? Cool. Explaining things either really poorly that people don't want to ask or super clearly. I hope it's the latter. All right. Setting up your personal spaces. If uh, you were at the session this morning, um, typing out full paths um, can be really annoying, right? And so we don't have to do that. And so what we can do is by begin by setting up our personal spaces by creating symbolic links, AKA sim links or soft links. And this is essentially, it's a file that's purpose is to point to another file or directory. So it's kind of a little ghost, but it helps with um, cutting down the amount you have to write and allows you to avoid having to type a full path. And so what we're going to do here, um, let me just show you. So. The first thing we want to do, and we're going to do this in our home space. So I'm in home Rockland. Now you can see this, the slash arc project TR bootcamp. That is the allocation code to the, the project. And you'd have to type that file path every time. But if you type LN comma S and then arc project TR bootcamp one, and then space, you can call it project, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna call it project and then press enter. And then you see here, I have this lighter green file now called project. And I can just go CD project. And if I print working directory, it's actually in that TR, it's, it's in that bootcamp allocation now. And so this is all of that stuff. And it saved me the, the time from having to do that. And so if everyone could just go ahead and do this for project, 
as well as the scratch space. I'll give you a few minutes to do this and uh, please ask any questions while you are doing. And again, make sure that you are in your, oh, what am I doing? Make sure you are in your home directory when you do this, just because um, it's more beneficial to be right at the top of the allocation. Uh, can I make text bigger on the slides? Um, I can try, but it gets really kind of here. Actually, you know what I'll do, Jeff? Um, you don't need to see mine. But yeah, so oh, now I'm just making a mess. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah, um, balancing this, and I only have one screen too, which makes it really annoying. I'm so used to having my multiple screens set up. Um, you don't need to remake the links every time you log into Sockeye. They will stay there. Um, yes, okay. So I, I was just going to say, because I'm part of multiple allocations, um, it can get a bit confusing to which ones they are. But if you only have a single allocation, um, you can probably just name them Project or Scratch. If you are part of multiple allocations, just be conscious of how you're naming them so you know which one you'll be taken to. Can I ask a question? Sure. If we make a, a mistake creating our symbolic link, can we just RM the link to delete it? How do we get rid of a link you create? A yeah, yeah. Link? So great question. So if I CD, um, you can't just, uh, I think it's an RM a recursive R. So if you RM project, well, let's say, oh no, it does. Yeah, so you just can RM it. Uh, just remember uh, to not include slash. That's what I did. That was my error. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because slash is a folder. Yeah. So if you include slash, that you're trying to actually delete a folder. Uh, but if you remove slash, that will be a file name. Uh, and this file is just like the shortcut. Uh, if you're using Windows, if you right click on any like .exe file, you can make a like a shortcut in your desktop. Yeah. Uh, this is something like that. Okay. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, I'm just going to get someone can just come and help. Oh. Uh, okay, Jeff, I see your question. I have project already as a symbolic limp. Don't remove it. That was just um, a person had made a mistake. And so I was just testing if the RM would remove it as a demo. Keep your project and scratch symbolic links. We will be using them in uh, the next portion of um, of the, the presentation. Oh, Jeff, you have your hand raised. Let me unmute you. Okay, you should be good to go. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I couldn't create one. You couldn't create one project. I, I tried creating it, and it. Um, so I'll try it again. It okay, says create symbolic link file exists. And so, if you go into ls, like if you press ls in your home directory, do you see yeah. it? Yeah, I'm. I see it. Okay, then you have it. But I didn't create it. Did so, you create um, it yesterday? Also, I don't think so. Sometimes copy and paste. Um, Jeff, do you have the ability to share your screen? Like, can you can you see it come up? Okay. Um, yes. um, what if I, what if I log out of the whole system and try logging in again and see? Um, um, I don't think that'll. Help, unfortunately. But, um, so if, if you press LS, do, do you see a project? I see ARC, CM, ETC, NIB64, Project SBIN, SRV. I see a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe I'm in the wrong spot. That's my can point. You press, can you press print working directory and tell me what you see? Uh, square bracket, jmoon07 at login, at login03. Forward slash square bracket close and then dollar sign. No, no. So if you press PWD, what comes up on, on this line where I have home or Auckland? Use the arrow. Just a blank. Uh, Just a slash. Blank. Let me log out and try again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like you're getting some funky yeah. behavior. But give, give it another try and then we can try to troubleshoot it. Um, for those people who have done this, 
Um, th this is the natural pause in here. We can take a break till 10 after, or maybe seven minutes after we can come back if you're done this, but we'll be here to hang around and answer questions if you don't have it. So yeah, if um, you wanna take a break, please do, but um, if you wanna hang out and ask questions, please do that as well. Uh, I'm just sending it in now, but there's a <laughs> And by the time I'm done, for people in the in-person room, would you mind muting yourself? Um, it was tough to talk to Jeff while um, we're both competing for the. Oh, oh. If, if it'll break things, because I know volume was an issue, but. Um, yeah, I think Jeff's trying to. Okay, okay. All right, Jeff Moon, how are you doing? I'm, oh. I'm trying to log in again. And then it's not giving me a duo push code. Jeff G just told me that um you were in the root directory. And I'm I'm wondering how yeah, you Yeah, that's might... probably it. Yeah. Okay. And and so you're not getting the duo. And so sometimes you need to actually go and click on the duo app. It might not give you the notification right at first. Yeah, I'm, I'm on uh, my phone. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It can be a bit. Uh, okay. All right. Let's try, now, let's try this one again. So it's from it's from this top level directory. Um, yeah. Home. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm seeing what you had before. What I think I did was I drilled down. I didn't know which directory you wanted this in for this. So I was in the other earlier directory just because there was some fun stuff here to play with. Um, uh, of course. Yeah. And so um, just just to to reiterate what I'm not actually sure if I'm reiterating this, maybe just to state it as the first, um, having it in your, your home space because it's the first place you you'll get to when you log into the system. That's where you're going to get the benefit to have these symbolic links because you, the file pass as you go down the path it's to save typing that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to type in this uh, symbolic link stuff and hopefully it'll work this time. Okay. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to run quickly and get some more water, but I'll be back on the air just quickly. Um, if you do have questions, please submit to the Q&A and uh, one of the helpers should be able to get you sorted out. Will do. Thanks, Nick. You're doing a great job, by the way. Oh, I'm trying, Jeff. Thanks it's so much. Amazing. It's amazing. Really. Your energy level is insane. Thank you. Really? <laughs> you know what's really insane? The amount of caffeine I've had. <laughs> um, keep taking it. It's working. Okay. See you in a second.
All right, back on the air. Hope everyone's doing well. We'll just get started in three or four minutes after our break's over. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um... All right, how are, how are we doing in uh, the in-person room? Oh, silence, that's scary. So yeah, just... I thought that they have their own mentoring tools, so they can only attend the uh, room. Um, they're in a room in the library watching them. And then there's people who are on Zoom as well. So we have a, a few different directions going on. Yeah. Um, trickier to manage from an instructor's perspective, but it's nice to bring everyone together. Yeah. All right. Um, in person room, are, 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 you, are you on the air? Jeff, Jerry, Liz? Can you guys hear me? I'll send a message quickly. Yeah, we are. Sorry. Okay. Um, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Good, good stuff. We did it. We're back on the air. Um, if there are no more questions, oh, thank you for jumping in the, the chat to let you know. I mean, you can hear me. Um, it's just me and one other person here can get lonely. It's good to have that feedback. Cool. So if there are no further questions, um, let's keep plowing ahead and talking about organizing folders. No, nope, that's not going to work. All right. So the objectives for this section, uh, we're going to identify the types of data and files your project will have and then start looking to create folders to organize your work. And then we'll create a few folders, but also start conceptualizing things that you can do going forward. And then we're going to explain the importance of README and files, other documentation, people know what you're doing, both while you're doing the project and after the fact. So in terms of what types of data files uh, that you have, um, th these might be a list, and by no means is this exhaustive, but you might have your raw input data that you're kind of going to do the analysis on. 
um, your metadata, any type of description or documentation about what your data is, um, your scripts or codes that you're going to be using to analyze that data. Um, your intermediate files, as I mentioned, you'll be spitting out some files that uh, might just be part of the processing or analyses of your data that you don't need. Um, your testing data or your files, you know, making sure that your code works, making sure your pipelines are clean. Um, your final results, that big, those world changing results that you want to keep. And then log files, these are files that document any type of changes or activities that have been happening on the system. Not everybody has them, but you might. And so when you're talking about the types of data files you have, um, First question, how big are your files? Do you have enough storage space? As I mentioned, you have five terabytes of scratch, five terabytes of project space. This is, is this enough to house them? And if you need to continuously move them around, if, if your allocation is being shared among five, 10, 15 people, balancing those spaces so everybody can adequately do their work is something you'll wanna consider. The next is like other people being able to access your files. As I mentioned, project and scratch space are shared amongst allocations. And so that might work for some people, but if you do have quite sensitive data that you don't want other people to see, it's um, up to you to create read and write permissions for those folders on, um, on your allocation to ensure that not everybody has access to them or, or people who shouldn't access them can't. Now, again, we talked about your workspace in Sockeye, we have the home, the project, and the Scratch, remembering that Scratch is the only one that your compute nodes can write to. And so in thinking about where to put your files, um, your raw input data and any type of documentation, your metadata, you can have in your project space because this is like kind of your main storage space, and you can create a separate folder under there called raw, right? This is your raw input data. It's a way of, of doing this. And, and we'll start kind of teasing this apart um, in just a few slides. Um, for your scripts, your intermediate files and your testing data, this is what you where you can put um, in your scratch space. And, and when I'm talking about your scripts and code going in your scratch space, this will start to make um, a bit more sense when you get to that running jobs section and in working with um, the, the scheduler that this will become immediately apparent why it is preferable or can be preferable to put that in your scratch space. Um, for your final results, you know, create a new directory in your project space called results. And that way, you know, you're, you're gonna know this. And obviously these are very high level folders. These are suggestions. You might wanna get more granular, but just thinking about where all these places and, and your files will be put. And then any type of log files that you are generating, if they are important, generate them as needed and, and where they are needed. All right, so we're going to start setting up things, and this is going to be a very lightweight thing, but just to get you kind of going, because we will do some moves with this in just a second, so I'm going to, oh, no, why did you do this? What's going on here? Oh, it's just doing that. Okay. So, is um in-person people, is that spacing okay? Can you see what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. And uh, apologies for the screen size. That, that's just kind of what we're stuck with when I'm doing the dual sharing one screen. And so um, what we're going to do now is move to the pro allocations project space. And so, oh, I didn't actually create, hold on. I'm telling you to do something. I didn't do it. I need to create a scratch space for this. Hmm. All right. Oh. Scratch is not a directory, come on. Oh, all right. Okay, okay gotcha. I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over that for now, but that's fine. Um, so if we CD to project, and because you're gonna use those symbolic links, we are now in project. Um, we're gonna make directories with our own names on it. So mkdir, and then however you want to name these directories. Again, noting that this is a shared space. So having your own work in your own directory makes sense go ahead and do that you can see some people are already going ahead and doing that give you a second to plow forward all right yeah people is racking up love seeing that uh, 10 20 yeah give you 10 more seconds Oh, 
Okay, and then go ahead and do the same thing in your scratch space. And so I'm making a symbolic link, but please don't follow this. Oh, I'm in project, oops. All right, so we can go forward with this now. Okay, so looking at file name, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier today. Um, when you're organizing your files and folders, naming is always important. Um, the biggest one, just use consistent naming. If you start naming things all over the place, it's um, it's a real nightmare. Um, the ones that we talk with Unix, special characters, including spaces, don't use those. Um, they cause problems when working with computing. Hyphens and underscores to separate words. Um, but the, the biggest one is like using prominent concepts and features of how you want your data to be organized. Now, now what I mean with this is that you know, if dates are really important, right? When you're, you're maybe you're collecting something, name your batches as they're coming out by dates, and, and, and don't use kind of like just a date like this. Use this in um, the the year, month, day format. Maybe you're not interested in the day. Maybe you're only interested in the month. Again, this is what's important to your data, but create folders that are going to organize um, your files properly. If your date, if um. What's more important with your data is the batches you're doing. It's not so much the date. Um, you can just name your data in batches. Um, be sure to use that 01, 02 format rather than just one or two. That'll help with organizing things. Um, moving forward to documenting your work. Um, so this is something that I hear kind of from both sides and that because our shared spaces, a lot of PIs will say, you know, I have graduate students, they're coming in, they're with me for a couple of years and they leave. And I look at their, their project and scratch space. It's a, like, I have no idea what they've done. They've done all this great work and I can't interpret any of it. It's garbage now. And so like from, you know, graduate students, like document your work, your PIs will love it. <laughs> Talking to you too. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. Um, but from a PI's perspective, you know, set the tone for what you want your graduate students to do. Set those expectations. Oh, yeah. And Jeff is adding some great things. Number of zeros depends on how many files you anticipate making. If you're making thousands of files, throw in a double zero up at the end. That's awesome, Jeff. Thanks. Um, jumping back to the documentation, readme files, always a good thing. Um, in terms of where you're going to put them, uh, or sorry, not where you're going to put them. I'm going to talk about the, the content first. Um, the project and purpose of the folder, um, the date the folder was created, who updated it. Talk about what people can find in that folder, how files were generated, any type of code or script that they were used. If you just kind of have the data, but not how you got the data, you know, you have issues with transparency and all that type of things. Um, if you're naming files, how you're, what the names mean, because they might not be readily apparent to people, as well as the relationship between files and folders. Now, when you're thinking of README files, you don't have to put them at every folder, but think about where they might be beneficial, right? If it's just your personal folder in, in project and you think that that's enough, great. But if you're dealing with a number of different projects that you have in your personal directory, Put those README files in those different um, those project folders just so people can interpret them. Um, in addition to README files, data dictionaries and code books. And so these are type of things to start talking about the variables and the actual data level. Obviously, like who created the, the data dictionary when it was last updated. And then describing your variables, including like any type of data types, the units, if you're using numbers, what type of numbers are those? Are they inches? Are they miles? Are they liters? Let people know what they're doing. Um, if your data is categorical, uh, talk about what those levels mean. 
any type of variable levels and, and, and descriptions because you might not have the variables typed out full in that CSV or spreadsheet. So just describe any type of variable names that you um you might be working with. And again, this is all about interpretability and you know relating this to uh, that 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 data lifecycle I was talking about at the beginning. Not only is this important kind of as you're doing your research, but when you get to the end of your project, if you're planning on depositing and preserving your data, keeping these updated throughout that project's lifetime is really going to kind of give you that edge and it's not going to make you have to do something after the fact where you're retrofitting it, you're trying to figure out what you're looking at. It's, it's just a really good um, kind of best practice to, to organize everything. And then finally, when you're creating um, either readmes and or data dictionaries codebooks, and separate files, use all capitals in the name and prepend it with an underscore right at the beginning. That way it'll come right at the top and it's very easy to see. All right, so any questions about that? Um, not hearing any questions. In-person room, you guys are having a good time? Yeah. You sound like you're having a blast. <laughs> Okay, good stuff. Love to hear it. All right, so if there isn't any question, we can keep on marching forward. Let's talk about transferring data. This is a fun one because there's no data on the system. What are we going to be doing? So the objectives of this session are to identify and use different ways to transfer data to and from Sockeye. Um, we're going to be talking about three main ones here. We're going to be using SCP, STFP, and wget, this is for downloading web data. Now, this is noting, Globus File Transfer is a piece of software that we have a subscription to at UBC. It is good for transferring large amounts of data with encryption. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but I am gonna plug Jerry's session on Friday morning about Chinook and Globus. Please come and check that out. It will be fantastic. You can do a great job. All right, but let's talk about SCP. It stands for Secure Copy. And this is a way to securely copy files and directories between two locations. Now you can see here, I wrote, you need to open a separate command line window to do this. Um, you don't always need to do this, but for the sake of this demonstration, I would encourage you to do this because it just makes it a little bit more straightforward. All right, so. Let's do this, and I have my own. Cool. So I'm going to move my desktop. All right. So um, in person, people, virtual people, uh, sizing. All right. Everyone can see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. So in order to transfer a local file from your home computer to Sockeye, this is the syntax you use. You start off with SCP. You have your local path, the local file name. Um, then you do your kind of your CWL at sockeye.arc.ubc.ca and then the file path that you would use. All right. So what that would look like for me is I, if I wanted to test uh, transfer this songs file from my desktop to my project space, this is what I would do. Now, um, if people want to follow along, feel free to do this. If you don't readily have a command line window, I apologize. I know that wasn't a prerequisite, but um, it's uh, this is how you would transfer data using this. So, if I go SCP and I'm already, so you can see I'm in my desktop, so I don't need to go there. Um, what do I have in my desktop actually? I'll do the song. All right, so I'll go SCP songs.txt and then my CWL at sockeye.arc.ubc.ca colon slash. Oh, that's not slash, that's a question mark. Um, then I'll go arc slash project. And then I have a folder in my project space called Nick Rockland. Press all right. And so because I'm connecting to a remote host, this is a local connection window. It wants to know my password. I enter it. Hopefully I entered it correctly. I want to text. Duo is working. Oh, permission denied. Beautiful. I love seeing that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> No, that's cool. Uh, I, I, yes, I obviously haven't set up permissions, but if I do that differently and I just take it off Nick Rock and I'll put it in the project space, hopefully that works. Uh, hi, Nick. I think you need to, you, you forgot 
the allocation code. Oh, that's what I'm doing. I'm not... Oh, doesn't, oh yeah. Isn't it because I created the symbolic link? Shouldn't I not need it? No, it's, it's you are, you are oh. in our project. It's not the symbolic link. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's why I keep it around, George. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. With Jerry's beautiful advice, let's see that. And if I don't get it the third time, what am I going to do? I don't know. I'll figure that out in like two to three seconds. Hey, grand success. And so you can see that there. And then if I go into my allocation, uh, oh, is this easy? No, this isn't. Oh, yeah, Nick Rockwell. And then you can see it's there. All right. So that's for a local file. If you wanted to um, do a whole directory, it would be a very similar syntax, only you would use that recursive R. Um, what do I have here? A data test. So, so yeah, it would be SCP, and I'm going to do the data test. And Rockland at snapdragon.ca. I'll remember what Jerry told me. I will do the full path. So arc project tr bootcamp one. Oh, I'm making all kinds of mistakes. Why are you guys letting me do this? <laughs> oh, it's been a long time. I needed to add the recursive R. And we'll try it one more time. I'm sorry, folks. It's been late in the day. Oh, getting into the right password now. Uh, take a breath, stretch it out. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Sorry. So I, I just did it and it, I had again to do the to get the dual code and all that. So every time I want a copy file, I need to uh, exactly <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why so I have to compress like all my files first and then so that's that's why we need write it. Uh, <laughs> because well, so, so you mean globus will be the answer. Okay. Yeah, they can save your authentication for seven days. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we could. Yeah, that, that's for a security. Okay, okay. <laughs> if you are using, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's sorry. That's if you are using yes. some other clusters, um, like the national platform, you don't have to do that. Okay, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, Jeff, I see you're asking to do this in another command line window. Which one should you use and why? Um, it's it just any kind of command line window. If you're on a PC, I use git bash. You can use PowerShell. If you're on Mac, you can use the terminal. It really just as any command line interface. And I think that goes to your question that you asked yesterday, which is the best. It really boils down to preference. And why? Um, why should you open a new window? Is that the question? Here, I'll unmute you if you want to. All right, Jeff. No, I can't find you. All right, Jeff, you should be allowed to talk. Yeah, I, I was just, so you say we're, we're not, I've got a MOBA X term session running and it would just seem logical to me to grab files or push files from desktop to Sockeye or Sockeye to desktop from that MOBA X term session. Why am I firing up a separate one from my current session? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so because in that mobile window or when you're connected to Sockeye, you can move files from Sockeye to your computer, but that is a connection to the remote host. It's not connected to your local desktop, so it won't be able to go both ways. Thank you. Does that make, does that make sense? I, I think so, yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering if I make sense either. Um, yeah, so, so you can do it the one way if you were connected to Sockeye, you can SCP directly from Sockeye, which, yeah. It's the exact opposite syntax as you can see here. Um, but yes, you would not be able to go connect to your local computer when you are in Sockeye. Those are two different locations. Thank you. 
No problem. And so, yeah, if, if you want, is there questions in um, the live room? Trying to recap where you are right now and why you would use SCP rather than Globit. Uh, um, if you like pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you're doing something that's quite simplistic, it is just a way to do it. Um, yeah. It's also like good to know because Globus is a license that the university are purchased for the university. So if you do go somewhere that doesn't have Globus, you would have to be able to use different tools. Um, so that's why we teach this as a fundamental. But um, we like Globus, obviously, <laughs> as we've bragged about it a good bit. And it does simplify things, particularly between uh, Chinook and Sockeye with that. So that's why we've added that as a credit session, but it is a license and not all universities or their core clusters would have that access point and depends where you are. Does that help, Nick? That's 100% helpful. And I was just gonna get to like, this This is not the easiest, but um, we had a question and, and this is plowing forward a little bit to SFTP. And there is some broader use cases for this, although what was asked yesterday, and I, will, I don't know if I'd be able to repeat the answer, was creating it so you don't have to authenticate every time you do this. But um, SFTP is kind of like SCP, but, but it's different. And I'll show you, it's an interactive shell. And so it stands for Secure File Transfer Protocol, encrypts data in, um, in transfer, and is an interactive shell and rather than a simple transfer. And so what I mean by that is that, um, here, I'll, I'll explain it first and we'll jump in. Um, so the, we talked about command line prompts earlier today in the Unix. So right now when we're in um, in Sockeye or in our local command terminal, you'll see the dollar sign. When you're in an SFTP session, it'll be an S and we're gonna begin by connecting to the remote host. And so by doing that, you'll just type in SFTP. Um, uh -huh, at Sockeye.ubc.ca. I'll enter my password for like the millionth time today. Hopefully it works. Um, oh, Duo's not working. Right on. Oh, I didn't. Thanks, man. <laughs> you can see I'm starting to lose it late in the day. Okay. And so you can see I am now in that because I have that S prompt. Now, one thing that you can see here, you can move around and view remote directories with normal Unix commands. So if I'm in Sockeye and I press print working directory, this is where I am in Sockeye. And if I want to change to my project space, I can go CD project, print working directory, and that's where I am. Now, at the same time, you're also in your local directory and you can, you can move around and view your local directories by putting an L in front of your Unix commands. So if I type in L PWD, this is where I am my I'm on my desktop at the same time. And just same thing, if I wanted to change directories, it's L plus CD, L plus any type of uh, regular Unix commands. And in order to set up this transfer, you have to be in the ID and um, the correct directory on both your local machine as well as your remote working directory. Um, have I lost anybody? Is that making sense the way that I'm explaining this? I think we are good. Uh, a little bit. Okay, yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, okay. Oh, we do have a question coming in. Okay, you are lost. I'm sorry. Um, Maybe you can start again. I need to start again? Okay. So, so, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So, right now, I, I'm in an SFTP session, right? And if so, if I go print working directory, much like we've done this, I'm in Sockeye. So, this is my remote working directory. And I'm in the project space for the boot camp. Does that make sense to people? So I, I've got the power to speak, so I'm going to speak. How, do it, how did you how did you get to where you are? Because we're not we're not where you are. Is that correct? oh so sorry? Did um I entered this the SFTP at? Oh, so we're supposed to do that? Um yeah. Um, if you're <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. so, I think we're all still afraid of breaking something locally or remotely. You, no, sorry, you won't break things. I'm, I was assuming people were following along with me. I'm making all kinds of terrible assumptions this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Uh, you have to. Terminal. Yeah, you have to do it from 
not from Sokai. Yeah. You have to do it by opening a new terminal. So if you don't have another terminal, you can watch Nick and then walk through it separately. You can use PowerShell or some other tool. Um, uh, but that's where you are. You're not in Sockeye right now. You're referencing Sockeye from this terminal. Yes, sorry. And I thought I had explained that. For, it's the same as SCP where you want to bring up another window. OK, so I should perhaps fire up PowerShell and try and do this. Yeah, sure. OK, thank you. I'll give people a couple of minutes to, to try that. The plus side, Nick, is everybody's going to love Globus after this. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's a big plug for that. If we inflict paid on them and then they use the wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I think that I'm not sure what I want. Okay, I'm not sure. 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 I'm yeah, and so, so how do I go back to that, that login home area? So I'm just making sure that. Oh, it doesn't bring you back up one from project. You can or go back to home. Oh, I appreciate you coming, man. Thanks so much. By doing that, or you can just get that. Yeah, so, so doing CDT. I'm in, Nick, just so you know. Thanks. Okay, wonderful, Jeff. Um, how are other people doing? Did I just completely break this whole session by introducing transferring data? Because I always get to All right. I'm sorry. Still walking through it. No worries. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to see that. Yeah, maybe on SFTP, maybe. Yeah, so CD slash. Okay. Okay. Well, take me to all the agents of the same. Okay. So I'm going to just. I think we can scrap this. Um, <laughs> let's get out of here. I, I'm going to apologize. Sorry, this is a terrible idea. I thought I'd show you how to transfer for data. Let's just move on. Um, if you have any questions, cool. Um, Wget is a much more straightforward thing, and there's way there's a there's a use case for it. This is for just downloading web data, and we can do this hopefully quite easily. And so um, when I say hopefully quite easily, we'll see how that works, right? Um, so it's just a simple command that if there is data that you want from the um, the web, it's wget plus URL. And so um, if you go into the OSF page, I have some tree swallow data here. And so this is from a data repository called Ferter. I'm going to be doing a session on Friday talking about data deposits where you can uh, deposit, preserve, and share your data. And you can see that um, there is a data set here. They got their licenses, their readmes, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I'll give people a couple seconds to catch up on this web page if they want. Um, you can see, though, if I click on one of these files, it'll either download it straight to my computer, or if I go for the whole data set, just, um, just exit. Yeah, that's the so exit. Oh, are people still? I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, how are people doing? 
Marginal at best. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe you could just watch me do this, but if you can follow along and do that. Um, if I click on one of the data sets, you can see it actually brings up uh, Globus because further as a, um, a data repository works with Globus, it's really quite friendly in that respect, um, but not all data repositories do. And so if you wanted some data from the web that didn't work with this, you could just right click on the data and copy the link. And then if I go back in to Sockeye, oh, I'm jumping out everywhere. I'll make this bigger. Oh, little zoom window in my way. Let me move that I'll clear. And I just type in wget um, and that website. And you can see it, it just quickly downloaded there, ls. And then I have that tree swallow data.csv into my files. I'm, I'm going to take I'm going to take a, a advantage of my unmutedness. Um, where should we be when we execute that command so that the data don't go into some high level directory? Where should we be? Should um, we be in, in our scratch? So, uh, this could be in your personal directory, the one that you created in project. Okay. Yeah, so sorry, yes, I, I am in my project space. And this again, this is your raw input data. So if you wanted to keep it in your project space there, transfer it in and then um yeah you could do any analyses on that data that you might want and so um I think luckily for everybody, this is this is the end of it. This is the last thing I wanted to show you today. I do apologize for this whole section. I think, um, you know, first time you run a, a session, you have ideas of how it's going to go. And this one just went off the rails. I made jokes about it at the beginning. Um, that's what happened. The <laughs> um, but I think what I was trying to show is that there are different ways to move data to and from Sockeye, be they from different sources. Um, this is a good example to show why Globus is a good um, good way to do this. It can just do it much more simply. It does work with that graphical user interface. Come out to Jerry's session on Friday. Um, again, I, I do apologize. I have lost anybody, um, but happy to stick around if there are any more questions. Also, if anyone wants to run through the lesson, you have access um, for the whole week to the training allocation. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. We're happy to explain um, any of the error messages. It, like we've said, beginning, no stupid questions. It's a learning curve. And uh, there's different ways to transfer the data. And sometimes they feel very painful. And that's why some of us really like Globus better than other things. But it's good to know the fundamentals. So that's why we included it. But yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Okay, and are there any last minute questions? Oh, you want to <laughs> show us the STP? Okay, um, I can, yeah, if, if you want me to. I feel embarrassed at this point, but yeah, let's jump back in. Um, okay. So, and we just copy the link. All right. So, in terms of that STP section, all right, giving, giving this another try. So if you are in your own command line window, you can press SFTP, your CWL at sockeye.arc.ubc.ca. Um, I think this is straight. Um, yeah, we'll see where this goes off the rails. But so far, we're trying again, based by, it was by request. Um, I'm going to enter my password. Um, I'll authenticate. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Um, to the person who requested here, maybe I'll just unmute you if you want to follow. All right, so you are allowed to talk if you want to follow along with me. Hi, yes, please. Hi. <laughs>
Okay, perfect. Yes. So sorry about terrible instruction, but let's try to let's make redemption here. Okay. Have you followed along at this point? Yes, I'm actually at the like I was able to do the LP, WD, and the LS and all that stuff. Sure. Okay. Cool. And so um just to do that, so print working directory. I'm in my home space. Mm -hmm. Got some stuff there. Um, I'm also if I do the LP WD. I'm in my desktop. Okay, so going to the next slide, <laughs> we didn't quite get here because things went off the rails beforehand, but to move, um, to the, this put command will move data from your local machine to the remote host. And so if I look at what I have, so if I go LLS, so seeing what I have in my desktop, I'm gonna try to move this songs to my current working directory, which is my home. And so I would just write get songs.txt and then press enter. Oh, how is that not? Oh, sorry. Did we, oh, we, we missed put. That's what it was. I'm losing my mind. Put songs.txt. And that just downloaded it to my home space. Okay. Um. I am, for some reason, in the ARC project. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, um, so where are you on your, your personal computer? Like, what was the last command I entered? So um, in your personal computer, if you type L, P, W, D, mm -hmm. what, what comes up here? Oh, um, my desktop. Okay, and so if you find a file on your desktop and just if you want to see it, you go L, LS, because LS will list things. Mm -hmm. um, if you just want to pick any of the files that come okay. up on your desktop and then write put and then the file name. Okay. Hmm. Sorry, one second. I think I just uh, made an error. No, oh. no such file or directory. Okay, uh, um, that's from your personal computer. Yeah. Oh no, I don't know why it keeps changing to the okay. Hold on. Um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm on my desktop, but I guess, I don't know why it's saying that there's no, maybe that I just made a spelling error. Um, it's possible, yeah, so try to give it again. Yeah, I'll do it again. After STEFP commands, you still see sockeye. Um, so for the person who write that, um, did you do your SFTP in a separate window? Or Jeff, did you want to answer this live or are you doing this for me? SFTP with the sideways carrot is normal. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so just one more question. Why would yeah. you use um, the first method you showed us if they're the second one and the third one? Like, are they limitations to when you can um, use? Uh, so maybe I can answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because um, I, I'm not sure for other disciplines, but at least for bioinformatics, um, when, when we do sequencing, um from like by some vendors they usually provide a few options for us and sometimes sftp sometimes scp sometimes other methods so you don't have other choices you have to like use their methods to download the data once these uh, finished sequencing and get the data i see okay um one last question sorry um so I work at the BC Children's Hospital. Um, and if 
I'm on that VPN. Does that affect the method that I can use? Like, will I still be able to use the SF, uh, SFTP? I guess maybe it depends on the security on there, maybe, if I can. I don't know. Uh, you mean whether you can use SFTP to connect to Sokai? Yeah. Uh, if you can, uh, as long as you can connect to Sokai with SSH, you can connect to Sokai with SFTP. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, are there any other questions? No? Okay. Um, well, I think we had a stronger start than we did for a finish. That's just how it went today. Um, I do apologize for that, but I encourage you to come out to the sessions tomorrow and throughout the week. Um, thanks so much for all your patience for coming out. And um, yes, please do leave feedback. I think the feedback I'm writing down is uh, limit data transfer and um, yeah, really reestablish uh, what should be taught there. But um, any type of feedback you could give for this session would be much appreciated and will sharpen up. And um, yeah, I hope to see all of you um, out there using Sokka, doing your thing. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming up. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you.